from Palladian Networks. So today uh, we are here for a webinar on understanding mobile application security. How can we secure mobile applications for various platforms? So uh, talking about me, my name is Aryam Jetty. I have two plus years of experience in information security and digital forensics. I am trained in mobile security and exploitative testing. Other than this, I have uh, various skill sets like source code review, application security, vulnerability assessment, penetration testing, and etc. These are my contact details. You can contact me through LinkedIn or through my email ID. So this is uh, going to be our agenda for this evening. We'll introduce ourselves to the model and next web versus mobile attack surface and threat model, key findings and mobile OWASP testing, OWASP top 10. And next we'll also see how do we break the application and understand it. We'll see demos. Uh, we'll, we'll see good enough uh, demos if, we, uh, if time permits and then mitigations for famous attacks and then we'll come to the presentation for today. So basically today one of the most important things in our ecosystem is a mobile. Without a mobile no one can sustain these days. If you see the picture depicts in 2005 if there was a gathering people would try and stand up to look at the person who is speaking but today everything was phone. So that's why I just mentioned why just shake hands when you can take a selfie. Next, this is a small start by Statista on the global traffic and how uh, fastly it is increasing. So this shows the increase in traffic which is going to be from 2030 to 2009. You can see uh, the traffic which is there per active subscription. Per active subscription in the sense per a mobile number registered, this is the traffic which is going on an average, on an average. So now this is going to move to a smartphone, smartphone traffic of 10 exabytes. So that, that is how there will be a huge leap in the traffic usage. Critical data on a person's mobile system is such banking, mail, WhatsApp, contacts, and his other uh, social networking and business profiling information. Right? Sometimes what happens is even if your bank banking application does not store any sensitive data about your uh, banking details, your WhatsApp has everything because you might have sent uh, someone your details on WhatsApp or your card details on WhatsApp. So Everything is there in your phone. About you, everything is there in your mobile phone. So next, this is a small survey which has uh, been taken place on top 100 paid apps. So you can see that in Apple, 87% have been hacked and in Android, 97% have been hacked. So these, these, are, uh, these are paid apps. Yeah, these are paid apps. Now just think about the security which you have in free apps which are available on the Play Store and also think about the applications which are available from a third party website where you download an APK and install it onto your mobile phone. Just assume what are the security levels there. So these are the applications who make their bread and butter out of uh, the applications. So basic infographic threat model to show you uh, what are the basic threats involved in a mobile application? First, you can see that if the application, the application itself is also a threat. If the application is not properly built or securely built, then the application itself might leak data. Right? Data is a critical thing which is coming out of the application. And next, there might be other applications posted on your mobile which can steal the data of other applications, right? So other than these, again you have uh, threats regarding theft because uh, even stealing a mobile is stealing your data on the mobile. You might think that I have uh, a key pattern, I have lock pattern installed. How can someone get my data? 
but there are hardwares which can crack your mobile lock patterns within minutes. So how, how do you think cases are cracked where mobile uh, phones are evidences? Without even cracking the pin, you can get the entire data of the mobile. So there are various other techniques using which you can do it. And again, there are infrastructure vulnerabilities, which are server-side vulnerabilities and cloud-based vulnerabilities. You might have heard about the cloud attacks, which have been done on uh, um, I, I, iCloud, where uh, many pictures were leaked. So again, the, these are infrastructure level, cloud level uh, vulnerabilities. So various operating systems which we have in this ecosystem are Android, iOS, Symbian, Blackberry, WebOS, Bada, Meetgo and Windows Phone. So again, all, all these applications are built differently in, in, different, uh, in different languages and different architectures. So the security model is also different for all of them and the security approach and the testing approach is also different for all of them. So the major players are Apple and Android. So because, uh, because of Android uh, being open source and uh, being more user friendly and Apple being uh, and the Apple because of the craze of its handset both are the major players. So let us start with Android and see what is the history of Android. So basically Android has started with Cupcake, Donut, then Eclair, Froyo, Gingerbread, Honeycomb, Ice Cream Sandwich, Jelly Bean, Kit Kat. They have their numbering versions also 2.1, 2.0.1, 4.1, 4.0.1 and the latest being Kit Kat. So there, there are various vulnerabilities which have been discovered at each and every platform level and when a new upgrade is coming, it is not just about the features. It, it is also about the security loopholes which which have been present in the previous versions. So there might be a uh, there might be patches coming or there might be a complete update of the operating system. So this we will see in further slides. So this is a basic Android architecture which has been given by the Android uh, developer blocks. So if you see in the Android framework, at the top lie the applic applications and at the bottom lie the Linux kernel. So applications are basically everything which you can see click, uh, on your uh, uh, handset. So uh, just for example, we've given alarm, browser, calculator, calendar, etc. And next comes the Android framework. So the backend of these applications uh, the design of the backend of these applications involve the Android framework where you will be having the content providers, the managers, managers in the sense which will be managing the activities, locations, the packages which are involved and the uh, view based systems. And these Android framework further are connected to the native libraries from there, uh, from where these Android uh, framework import uh, libraries from which are audio manager, free type, and there are many other libraries. You can also build uh, custom libraries for custom ROMs. Next is Android Runtime. So basically Android Runtime involves uh, Dalvik VM. So we'll, we'll also be talking about uh, Dalvik VM in our further slide. So I'll uh, show you the uh, difference between the running of a Dalvik VM and a Java VM. And next is a hardware abstraction layer which is uh, shortly called as hard, uh, which has the audio, Bluetooth, camera, DRM, external storage, graphics. So these all are integrated at this level. And next is the kernel. So basically Android shares a Linux kernel, which has again iOS and uh, power management and everything. So moving on. Security architecture. So the security architecture of Android is two-tier security model where it inherits both Linux-based security approach and it has its custom security uh, principles as well. In Android, each have as its separate uh, UID and GID. UID being the user ID and uh, GID being the group ID. Okay, so uh, this UID and uh, GID are given in order to control uh, which are the resources which they can access. 
So if you have a particular group of applications, you will give access to particular resources to that group so that all the applications sharing that group ID can access. Next, Linux permissions are applied to the resource set files. So if you see the permission, uh, permission model of uh, Android, it is almost similar to Linux with all the retry, execute and the similar numbering structure for the permissions. Next, further deep diving into Android permissions. Basically, the Android permissions are defined in a file called as androidmanifest.xml. This resides within your APK. So, basically, it is specified by the developer what all are the permissions which are required or the framework directly creates a manifest.xml file which, uh, in which the permissions are given. Right? So this manifest.xml file holds the permission definition and usage and also we can define what are all the external libraries which we can use. Next, there are also few flaws in Android uh, manifest.xml uh, and the permission model. If uh, you see at platform level and Android uh, versions which are less than 4.0 did not need read external storage to read SD card. So now what happens is any application even without requiring access to the external storage they can read any data from your SD card. So the all the information on your SD card is palatable. So this has been patched in the later versions. Next, format. The basic format of an Android application is .apk. You might be seeing it uh, when you download an APK from a third party file. This is nothing just a, another archive file with a different extension. So an archive file, uh, it consists of small files which are basic code files so and uh, raw files and other resources basically. So these small files are the assembly files for the text. So if you see uh, in the given picture, we've uh, uh, I tried to uh, show the difference between a uh, Java VM and Dart VM. So out of the Java, once the byte code is generated, which is the dot class file, okay, uh, a, a specialized com uh, compiler and assembler is run to generate a text file, which is a Dalvik uh, uh, code, and it is a Dalvik VM. Uh, a specific code so that the Dalvik VM runs on it. So basically a Dalvik virtual machine is a registry based virtual machine which um, so the Dalvik virtual machine is designed to run on low memory. So if you have a Java virtual machine they might be having uh, uh, they, they, they can take uh, higher memory spaces but DVM is specialized and it is designed to run on low uh, low memory. Okay, so this uh, .dx file is a byte code of uh, Dalvik virtual machine. Similarly, which is a byte code, of, um, we have a byte code for Java virtual machine and it runs with uh, JIT. So, signing in Android. In Android, there is no one uh, body to sign the application. In iOS, basically what happens is, we will be discussing it later, but uh, the topic has come, so I tell you. So in iOS, what happens is, when you upload any file to uh, uh, to, uh, to the I iOS app store, so iOS has its own proprietary technique called as the fair, uh, proprietary algorithm called as the fair play algorithm, which uh, is used to sign the application. So once you have this application signed, so what, what, what you can do is, even if you download it, you cannot directly uh, reverse engineer the application. First you need to have to break this uh, signature and then only you can open the code files. Otherwise the code files are signed and you cannot reverse engineer them properly. So this I will be explaining it to you uh, when we discuss iOS. So here the developer could generate his own certificates and the app is signed with the public key whereas its private key uh, stays with the developer. 
So the tools uh, which we uh, which we can use to sign our own applications are key tool and jar signer. We can generate our own keys and we can sign the application. Android app components. So these are five. There are many other components as well, but these are five major components in Android application that are easily uh, vulnerable if not properly built. So first is the activities. So activities are uh, something which are defined in C. So basically, uh, I, I just uh, show it to you in the next slides. Activities, broadcast receiver, shared preferences, intents, and content providers. So activities. So activity is everything you see and click on the application. So now, if you if you are seeing a screen, it is a defined activity. Now, once you click and move to a secondary screen, that is another activity. Now, the process of moving from one activity to other activity involves an intent to be sent. So once, if you see here in the first screen, it, it is saying that click me. So once you click here, an intent is generated within the application and that intent is processed so that, and, and the intent states that I want to open the next page. Once this uh, is clicked, I want to open the next page. So that intent is processed and your secondary activity page is open. So whatever you see is an activity and if once you are moving from one activity to other activity or one screen to other screen or one application to other application, there is an intent involved. So we have covered two things here, activities and intents. This is again, as I told you, intent. I need a camera. So this is how uh, uh, we are depicting an inter-application uh, communication. So within intra-application, it is handled uh, within the application. But for inter-application, you need to have an intent defined and exported. So we'll be uh, looking at this uh, once we unpack uh, the file. So in this intent, here you see that I need a camera. So now, if other application has uh, an, an intent, uh, an, an intent with uh, a camera available and if it is ready to process this intent, it will provide the camera to be used to this application. So uh, that is how it is done. Next is broadcast receivers. So uh, basically the broadcast receivers are like when, when, uh, when, when your Android system, if you see uh, there is an interaction which is going between the Android application and the Android system, when you have a low battery, when your screen is off and when there is uh, something which needs to be integrated to the app, the Android system generates a broadcast which is sent to all the applications and the particular broadcast receivers which have been defined will take this announcement. So basically, uh, the, the system uh, generates a broadcast which is system-wide broadcast and the broadcast receiver of the application takes these broadcasts. Next. Uh, we also need to see what are shared preferences. So we have also had something called as shared preferences written here. So basically shared preferences are files where you store small uh, key values and this file is maintained by the framework. So in this shared preferences file, if you have uh, some small key values which are uh, which you need to be exchanged between other apps or within the application, you can define them in these shared preferences files so that you can just keep the file to be shared and other applications can access this file. And next, we have to see about content providers. So content providers are basically interfaces which connect data to a process. So if you see an URL, now if you type www.google.com, right? HTTP uh, column slash slash www.google.com. So this URL is not the website. 
but this URL, once you write it in your browser, it is helping you connect to the website where the data is hosted, which you would like to see. In the same way, content providers are URIs where it connects the process to the data which it requires. Okay, so in order to have a content provider, we need to also have a content resolver once the content provider gives the data. Next is vulnerabilities. So basically the vulnerabilities are of two types. OS vulnerabilities and application vulnerabilities. OS vulnerabilities are the platform vulnerabilities itself. So basically for this you uh, cannot do anything except patching the vulnerabilities if patch is available or you can um, upgrade to the next versions if the update is available for your handset. And application vulnerabilities. So basically if you see MDM solutions and other solutions, they might help you deal with OS level vulnerabilities, but they, they will not help you deal with application level vulnerabilities. For you, application data is very critical. If the application is not well built, as we have seen in the threat model, there is a threat, uh, there is a probability that another application which is residing itself, itself, uh, that takes the data and sends it to, uh, to uploads it onto a server or anything. Next, we'll further uh, see into these vulnerabilities, OS vulnerabilities. So this is one recent, I uh, recently published uh, vulnerability for Android, which leaves more than 95% of Android ecosystem affected. Uh, it is not just mobiles, your IoT devices, anything which supports Android, is uh, which has Android, uh, is affected by this vulnerability. So uh, this vulnerability is basically present in the libraries, the C and C, um, the libraries which are present. So this vulnerability helps a uh, attacker just by sending a text. This is another text-based vulnerability. Previously we had one text-based vulnerability in iOS where you can send one text and your uh, phone crashes. So this is uh, something of similar kind for Android, once uh, the attacker sends an MMS which has uh, specially crafted uh, code, he will be directly able to get a remote code execution privilege on your system. So he does not need anything, he doesn't even want you to open that uh, message. It is not an on-click or action-based vulnerability. Just direct send a message and your uh, Android device will be affected. He can execute any code. So this is uh, a, a POC is yet to be uh, provided at uh, Black Hat this year. Next, application based vulnerabilities. There are many vulnerabilities in Android ecosystem, but uh, security uh, testing of Android at some points of time ignores few vulnerabilities and I have tried to uh, write those vulnerabilities in this slide. So there are logging based vulnerabilities, backup based vulnerabilities, injection based vulnerabilities, data leakage vulnerabilities which again have uh, logging and uh, backup as a subset of it and web view, based, web view is uh, one component of Android which can be attacked and other generic attacks. So again there are various types of uh, vulnerabilities here. One is the business logic and other is the application, the vulnerabilities on the device side. So but, uh, these days uh, many, many organizations consider business logic to be important. But if their data resides on a device, then the security at the device end is also questionable, which means at the user end as well. So if you are a um, if, if, if you are a banking uh, enterprise, then your information which is stored on the customer end is also very critical to you because that is again your customer information which you are not supposed to uh, pro provide it to uh, the uh, other people who don't have access, right? So next we will further see into uh, these attacks. So now, now we'll see a demo of uh, Android, how the application looks, how, how, uh, what all can we do with an application at uh, 
at device level. So first, so I'll, I'll be using an emulator. You can also use an uh, Android uh, device. Uh, and uh, our basic requirements are KDB, which is an Android debugger. ADB, APK tool, DDZY, Android device or an emulator, browser, a framework which we, which we can use to uh, automate uh, testing to a certain level. So first, I am using an emulator, which is an Nexus uh, 4 inch emulator and the applications on which I will be uh, showing you vulnerabilities are Insecure Bank and C. C is a test application which is provided by uh, Drozer itself and Insecure Bank is uh, an application uh, which is built to demonstrate uh, various flaws in Android. So basically in first Insecure Bank was built at Palladium and Insecure Bank uh, V2 was uh, built by someone else. Right. So first, now this is a basic ADD bundle in which we have an ADB uh, SDK manager where we can uh, uh, install and run an emulator right so first I have already run an emulator previously to avoid time delays so now I'll run an ADB this is basically a debugger module of Android so in order to connect your Android device to an ADB and, a, and your ADB to detect the Android device, the mobile phone should have a debugging mode enabled and your uh, PC to which you are connecting your mobile phone should uh, have the drivers of the mobile phone installed. Otherwise, you will not be able to see your uh, a device in the ADB list. Right? So, these are all the options which ADB has. So now I'll try and see whether I have any devices associated with ADB. So I have an emulator running which is associated with ADB, right? So now, see, I, it asks me to enter a password, but I don't remember the password. So I will try and bypass this screen to directly get an activity which is there inside. So I will try and access the post login modules by bypassing the screen itself. Okay. So now first let us see, uh, let us get familiar with uh, ADB a bit. So ADB gives you everything you want. So So using ADB, you can take a shell directly onto uh, the device and you can see that uh, it is a rooted uh, Android device. So you can say, directly see that I have root privileges here. So now once I have root, all the application data is residing in the data data folder. Right? So if you can see, all these are package names. So these, if you if you go to a Play Store and uh, you try and uh, go to a page where an app is there, you can see this package names in the URLs. So these are the package names with which the application is installed on your device. Right? So I am looking for 
something that is C, right? So you can see something called here com dot mwr example dot c. All the commands are similar to Linux, so you can use everything uh, similar to Linux. So now I want to pull this data out of C, and I want to uh, check the data whatever is present on the phone. So what I will do is adb pull data data. Com dot MWR dot example dot SC, right? So I have two files pulled. So uh, API was previously present, so you can see that database, uh, sorry, I think Sysstress was, uh, you can see that databases have been extracted. So this is something called as databases.db file, right? So now, if you use a tool called as SQLite DB, so this is a tool where you can uh, browse the format SQLite, right? So now we want to browse the data. So if you see, the pin is available in clear text in the database, right? So now what we will try and do is, we will uh, try and use a uh, application called as browser, which is a third party application installed on the same device and extract data and information out of it. Okay. So Drozer runs on a client uh, server model. So you should have the Drozer client, which is an APK, to be installed on the device and uh, the Drozer to be running on your system. So now, first point on ADB is we need to check, ensure that the Drozer client application is running. So we go to the device. So the browser agent is running 31415. So let's make sure that the traffic is going on the same port. So for that we use a forward command with adb. Right? So now we are ready to go with browser. So this is a Drozer console which has been given to us. Now from here we can interact with the Drozer agent which is present on the device and make it perform uh, various operations by showing commands. So now first I'll, I'll just uh, make you familiar with this uh, Drozer framework. So uh, using this command, we can find out uh, what all are the packages present in the 
uh, in, in the device. So once uh, we've got the package name, we can further try and gather information about the package. App.package.info right? So now, uh, while uh, waiting for this uh, information to be uh, retrieved, we uh, so this information, what uh, this browser will uh, give out is the manifest.xml uh, file information, whatever is present. So, uh, so it, it is taking time. So, uh, by the by the time it uh, fetches information for us, what we'll do is we'll uh, check how to unpack an application. So here we have C APK. So we have talked about this APK being just another and rename this file to be zip file. So you can see that I have got all these files just by unzipping the archive. So if you can see, I think there was some uh, issue with the traffic, if you can see, there is a info generated by the application, what all permissions it have, what, have, what are the shared libraries, what is the shared user ID, and where is the data directory actually present, and where is the APK actually present, right? So now, once we have all this information, Browser has this module, uh, scanner, you can call it a scanner module, where you can find the attack surface, where all can the vulnerabilities be in the application. So now, you can see uh, the attack surface, app.package.attack surface, com.mwr.example.c. So you see that it gives three activities exported, two content providers exported, and two services exported. Right? Now this seems to be interesting. Now let us see what all are these exported things, and let us see how can we exploit these. So now the first thing, let's check the activities. Then app dot activity activity dot info on dot mwr dot example dot c so these three are the activities which are exported right now let us see the android manifest dot xml file which has been generated you either don't get to see it or when you view it using Notepad or Notepad++, plus plus, all you see is something gibberish, right? So this is encoded. Now you have to remove this encoding. So now for that, you need to debug the application. For that, we are using something called as APK tool. Now let us rename this zip file back to an APK. So I think that it is... So here we have C. So it basically, the APK tool is a jar file. APK tool D C dot APK. 
done you can see a folder here right now so you can see that the manifest.xml file has been decoded and you can see all the permissions okay the activities the intents and everything write permission read permission everything present here okay so now again these are the uh, this is about the ui and uh, these are the resource files which are used and this is the small text files which we were talking about right so once we are here now what we can do is let us try and initiate an activity which is of post login okay now we see something here called as pw list i think that should give out the password list so uh, let me uh, run that activity so run app dot activity dot start component form dot m the here you need to give the package name and now the activity name which you want to start form dot mwr dot example dot cif dot tw list so before executing this now we are on a browser screen right so if you see in your background button you directly get to the password screen there are no passwords present here so that is why you are not uh, getting to see anything okay so you can add a new password so this pc username adrian email password123 I'm just giving this for testing purpose. Please don't give that uh, simple passwords. So uh, now here you see that not not just uh, there is uh, just a bit of emulator issue, but still uh, the activity could have been performed here clearly. So here you can see that not just uh, entering to the next screen. We can also perform operations. Now we can see in the settings you can go there, change pin and everything. Okay. So now, so in the attack surface we have also seen something called as content providers exported. Now let us see what are these content providers exported and how can we get to these? Um, app dot provider dot info hyphen a com dot mwr dot example dot c right so you see that it is a db content provider so hence we can uh, make out that it is database backed up content provider so now let us try and see what all vulnerabilities we can find what all injection vulnerabilities we can find on this okay So now, scanner dot provider dot find URIs a com dot mwr dot example dot c. So this is a scanner module where uh, a browser scans the database uh, backed up queries see if you see it has been able to access 
DB content provider keys, DB content provider passwords, DB content provider passwords. But there were no passwords in this seed, hence it could not uh, help us fetch anything. Okay, so now from this browser also has injection modules where you can directly perform an SQL injection. Right? So now, I mean this, let's uh, go ahead uh, with the presentation. So I, I have not uh, covered the reverse engineering of the Android application because it is uh, pretty much easy and many tutorials are available online for this. Right? So let us continue with the presentation. Right? So now, lo logging based vulnerability. So how, how do you able to, how can you see a Log, uh, log, how can you uh, see the logs of your device? So for this, ADP provides something called as logcat. Right? So these, you can, these are the logs which are generated by uh, your device and you can move them to a particular location. You can perform search operations on them. You can, uh, if it is a Linux uh, uh, based system, you can do grep and uh, give exact data what all you want, uh, want out of it. So Facebook had a famous vulnerability in uh, this logcat. So what Facebook did is, if you know that Facebook works on an authentication token uh, mechanism. So once your uh, application has been authenticated, uh, an uh, a, a authentic token is generated and it is stored on your device or it is uh, stored on your uh, uh, system to uh, provide further access, right? So in Facebook what happened is when this authentication uh, token was being copied into the system, it was also being generated in the log. So now once you have the authentication token, the only thing you have to do is send a request and in the response just change the authentication token you'll get the uh, you, you'll get the profile of the person whom you are looking for right this is one uh, vulnerability so in logging based vulnerabilities there might be many 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 uh, sensitive uh, information sensitive snippets which are involved next is backup based vulnerabilities so now what happens is if you allow backup for your application, so there's a parameter called as allow backup. So if you allow backup for your application, there might be other applications who are taking backup of your application and are uploading elsewhere. Once you take the backup of the application, there is just a small process uh, and a few tools using which you remove the uh, backup header and just uh, unzip or untar the application creating a list file and get everything out of the application. Whatever the application has, the databases and everything, you can get everything. Next is injection based vulnerabilities. Now as we see, SQLite is being, SQLite DB, dot DB is being used by the application. Now wherever you have a DB, there is one thing which follows, that is an SQL injection. So now, when you are uh, when you're testing an Android application, it is not uh, mandatory that only your server side should have vulnerabilities. Even your client database can have vulnerabilities. For this, uh, Drozer has few uh, modules. I, as I've just shown you, scanner provider find URIs. If the database has information, you will directly get the URIs, which you can query. And from there itself, you can perform a projection based. Uh, so projection is another handle in Drozer. Uh, using which you can uh, perform SQL injections. Okay. Next is data leakage vulnerabilities. So data leakage vulnerabilities involves this logging, backup, and other applications being able to uh, share your shared preferences, everything. WebView. WebView is a component using which we uh, use uh, Java scripts uh, in the application. So now when we say JavaScript. So basically it is to integrate HTML and JavaScript. So now when we say JavaScript, another thing is there which follows. That is a cross-site scripting attack. Right? So using web views, if your web view uh, implements JavaScript and the input is not properly validated, you can perform cross-site scripting attack on your Android application. Right? That's a generic and uh, other business case attacks. So now I will tell you the mitigations for these attacks. Secure coding Android. 
creating secure content task affinity so basically uh, do not specify task affinity task affinity is a parameter which is there in the android uh, module which you set it uh, it gives a description of uh, it gives a description to other applications of what you can perform using that activity next is do not specify the launch mode next is explicitly set the exported attribute to false now we have seen that those uh, applications uh, the sieve application has content providers uris and everything uh, exported right so now basically if you don't uh, give any value to the attribute exported the default value it takes is two so the uh, default value it takes is two it again depends on framework to framework but the default value is true so now you need to set this exported to be false in order to make sure those activities are not accessed by third party applications okay so next handle the received intent carefully and securely even though the intent was sent from the same application this is what we were talking about in the exported uh, attribute so if you have an activity exported if you have a broadcast receiver exported if you have a content provider exported if you have a service exported everything you try and do to access it generates an intent so if these intents are handled carefully then you can handle all these vulnerabilities next sensitive information can be sent uh, since it is sending and receiving all within the same application so that is why intent next to make activity private right so the exported is uh, set to false in the android manifest.xml to make the activity private so that the own the application itself can access the activity creating a secure database so the two thumb rules here are do not store anything critical on the database encrypt the db so do not store anything in the database if you are a banking uh, enterprise you can store simple uh, things like uh, country codes um, and simple simple things which even on um, uh, exploitation or revealing will not cause uh, any defect if you're storing account numbers if you're storing anything within the application in clear text then that is clearly vulnerable so next is encrypt the db so if you're using some if you're storing something in the db either use hashing techniques solitaire hashing techniques so that it is only one way algorithm and decrypting it is not possible so if you see previously whatsapp had uh, this mechanism of uh, uh, not uh, encrypting its uh, db files it was just one year ago so you uh, pull uh, data out of your android mobile you just get the database files put it onto sql db you can see chats which are stored in your db each and everything right later they've come up with crypt uh, dot db which is an dot crypt dot db which is an encrypted version so even though they are coming up with uh, so many updates uh, with their encryption models someone or the other is uh, giving out the cracking mechanism as well so the current uh, crypt version does not have a crack uh, as of now but soon it will be also released so think it is a 19 billion dollar application and it itself is not able to sustain attacks, sustain client side attacks. So just uh, have an, uh, uh, just think about your application. Creating a secure log. So there are a few functions like system out, output error, uh, log e, write input errors. So these errors or these input access uh, uh, functions whatever they generate these things should not be locked just like uh, you see the stack trace errors and everything which you look at in the uh, regular uh, code review mechanisms of a web application right even your mobile applications can also have stack traces uh, not exactly stack traces but similar errors okay so make sure all these errors are handled properly and are not locked into uh, the locket until unless it is necessary so creating a secure web view so this is a chart uh, which we define for a secure web view so start creating a web view 
application only accesses content stored in the APK, which means application accesses everything, the resource contents, everything within the APK, then you can uh, st get stored the asset in uh, set and ICP. And what you can do is here you can give a web view to access HTML but not JavaScript until unless it is useful. Okay, because that is a recommendation. Even if it is using content within within the APK itself, the content is not going anywhere else or any third party application or the third party user does not have access to that particular uh, the content. You can just uh, go ahead and implement web view for HTML. So secure cryptography. This is uh, another small uh, flowchart which uh, I uh, designed for cryptography. So uh, this is it about uh, handwrite. Right? So we'll quickly uh, run through it as we're running out of time. We'll just quickly run through uh, iOS application vulnerabilities and iOS uh, secure coding modules. Okay, so first thing, iOS, native applications port of Mac OS to ARM CPU. Apps are coded in Objective-C and Swift, iOS simulator. Apps are zipped with .IP extension and signed. As we've spoken in the previous Android module, they have their own signing mechanism. And whenever uh, you uh, try to extract or pull out a IPA file which has been signed by the uh, what is it? Uh, the the store, Apple store, you will not be able to reverse it easily. It is reversible, but you will not be able to reverse it easily. So jailbreaking, as we have routing in Android, we have jailbreaking in uh, iOS, uh, iOS or iPhones. So jailbreaking gives you unrestricted access, file system access, install unsigned applications, which is third party install useful for auditing apps. So if you jailbreak, you can install third party audit applications and connect your system to third party audit, applica uh, audit applications on uh, other systems and uh, perform security audits. You can uh, add third party repositories and CDI. CDI is basically a browser uh, like application for to install third party repositories. So this is a basic structure of an iOS assessment. First is application map, mapping, client attacks, network attacks, and uh, server attacks, platform mapping, application architecture, understand the app, data flow mapping, binary analysis, file system analysis, runtime analysis, install traffic, run traffic, TCP stack. So let us ignore network and server attacks because uh, they will be almost similar for uh, web based attacks. Application mapping and uh, client attacks is what uh, we need to see and understand. So local storage, plist file. So basically plist file is a, a process list file which has the configurations uh, installed for any uh, given ap uh, application, right? So uh, if, if you have an IPA, it has plist files which consists of configuration files and similarly uh, like XML files of uh, Android, the manifest XML files of Android. And next is your uh, n, uh, n user defaults. So n user defaults is a default class which is present in the iOS applications using which you can customize the behavior of the application. Okay. Next is SQLite, which is similarly used in Android as well. Keychain. Android has uh, iPhone. Uh, iOS has a keychain stored in uh, in the device itself, where it holds all the keys present uh, in the device. Okay, next is core services. Core services are the basic services which are provided by the device like location services and the other which the applications can access. Next is temporary files. Temporary files are the temp files uh, which are generated by the device and UI pasteboard. UI pasteboard is a uh, module uh, using which you can share data of one app by giving access to this UI pasteboard of that app to other app. Okay, so now log files, which we have uh, similarly for reversing an IPA. So as we spoke, reversing an IPA is not that easy. So first, what you need to do is 
you need to uh, uh, un unsign the application, whatever is signed, and then you need to uh, then then you need to uh, unzip it or untar it. Okay, so few ba uh, basic open source tools that you can reverse an IPIs, O tool, GDP, and IDID. Combination of these tools will help you to uh, untar the application. So other than this, uh, you can use uh, DD, uh, which is a command, uh, command Unix-like command. Uh, in which you can directly dump the uh, data. So iOS vulnerabilities, insecure data storage, extension vulnerabilities, attacks on third-party libraries, jailbreak, runtime manipulation, piracy detection, sensitive information and memory, transport layer security, client-side injection, information disclosure, broken cryptography, security decisions via untrusted input, side-channel data leakage, application touch. So insecure data storage, again, uh, just like we have uh, discussed in Android, nothing uh, should, uh, nothing critical should be stored uh, on your side. Extension uh, based uh, vulnerabilities, like in third party libraries which are vulnerable. Jailbreak, if your application, uh, if your device is jailbroken, it has full fledged access. So that is again another vulnerability. Runtime manipulation. So iOS uh, applications can be monitored and changed, uh, the data can be changed uh, during the runtime using runtime manipulation attacks. Piracy detection and sensitive information in memory, which again leads to insecure data storage, transport layer security. Client side injections, information disclosure, broken cryptography, uh, this as we uh, in encrypting and uh, using uh, algorithms which are obsolete like using MD5. Uh, for weak, uh, weak encryption and everything. Side channel data leakage, again, which uh, uh, has a subset of it as logging and everything. Application patching, right? So now let us see secure. how can we secure code in iOS. Local storage, as uh, defined, important. Uh, there is one more important vulnerability in uh, uh, iOS, which is the caching vulnerability. So now if you see, once you double tap the home button, iOS uh, gives you screens, what all screens are active in the background, right? So the, the moment you just tap on the screen, it gets loaded. But what you are seeing the moment you tap is an image or the screenshot of the application which has been taken and cached to uh, give smooth uh, access when you uh, move from one application to other application. So now let us assume that your application has user details and you have moved on to other uh, application and this application is running in the background and the device has taken a screenshot of the page where your user details are present and it is cached. So that is critical data, real critical data which is being cached and uh, this is again uh, vulnerable. So you should make sure what all pages need to be cached and what all pages need not be cached. Okay. So even if uh, you are caching it, you can also decide whether you can cache it uh, with information or without information so that the plain uh, background is loaded and the information is fetched from the server. Right. So important data like password, session IDs, etc. should never be stored locally on the device. End user defaults should never be used to store confidential information like passwords, authentication tokens, as they can be shared by other applications as well. P-list because it is a file present on your device itself. Passwords and any sensitive data should not be stored. These P-lists are uh, uh, similar to shared preferences, but the applicability is different. So even shared preferences are stored on the same device. Next is core data files are uh, also stored as unencrypted files in your database in the uh, application button. So your core data files, whatever are present in your uh, application needs to be encrypted. So uh, secure your transport layer. So basically uh, not by using self-signed certificates and whatever uh, mechanisms you implement on your SSL and uh, TLS basically. And important decisions like authentication and uh, authorization should be taken on the backend. And uh, sorry, I missed a point. Do not use a parameter unique to the device, MAC address, IP, UDID to determine things like session ID authentication. Now you may think that I have mapped my session ID with the MAC address. 
in a single request you can directly change the MAC address or you can manipulate uh, the MAC address and send it to and fool the server, right? Next, and if you are a banking application, we suggest go for a session ID for every new page so that uh, you go for uh, once once the user tries and uh, uh, backs the operation, he will not be able to get the data. Proper input validation should occur both on the client side as well as the server side, right? Runtime analysis. So you need to check what all can be done uh, at the runtime. So in order to uh, mitigate runtime analysis based vulnerabilities, you can try and block deep debuggers uh, getting attached to the applications. So there are many tutorials online and uh, there is a tutorial of InfoSec uh, Institute which you can try and uh, uh, see how you can block debuggers can uh, get, uh, from getting attached to the application and do not use UI web views so that you don't uh, fall prey to the fall as prey to the JavaScript based attacks. So automating testing and profiling. So to automate testing to a level, you can use uh, Drozer for Android, Introspy for security profiling at uh, code level as well. Uh, Introspy is available for both uh, Android and iOS and Snoopit. Snoopit is a tool for iOS. Other than these, if you uh, want to reverse engineer uh, application, there is a toolkit called as IREP by Veracode. So you can just start the server of the application and you can uh, just uh, reverse engineer the application. So these are the OWASP mobile top 10. Weak server side controls, insecure data storage, insufficient transport layer protection, unintended data leakage, poor authorization and authentication. Broken cryptography, client side injection, secure decisions via untrusted inputs, improper session handling, and lack of binary protections. Right, so I think we've uh, covered most of uh, these in the in this session. So that's it from my side. Any questions? Any queries? So I'm uh, once once I see the queries, I'll have yes a query on DB encryption. We have a query on DB encryption. Now, what do you use? There are again two types of encryption. Encrypt the data, uh, encrypt the data uh, within the uh, database, or encrypt the database on whole itself, right? So now, what what you can uh, do here is, you can uh, there uh, you can use alg uh, specialized algorithms where you can. Uh, and encrypt uh, the database. So once you uh, run this database through the algorithm, what it does is it generates a cryptic database whose key is generated uh, and stored on the device uh, itself. One, one key is stored on the device and other key comes from the server. So that whenever you uh, perform a backup or fetch data from there, you just get the data directly from the uh, database. Or one simple thing is if you are uh, if, if you're using a uh, within uh, database encryption, use a sorted uh, hashing technique or a hashing technique with a strong algorithm so that you don't get, uh, you, uh, your data doesn't uh, get reversed so easily. Yeah, so any other queries? Yeah, the names of the uh, applications which 
uh, we, we can use for automation or dozer for Android, Intro Spy for Android and iOS, Snoopit for iOS. So these are uh, used to understand uh, the vulnerabilities and loopholes which can be pre uh, present in the uh, um, application. And uh, as I told you, IRET is uh, another uh, application which will uh, help you understand the reverse engineering of IPA in very detail. Yes, do you have a checklist that you can share for secure coding for mobile app that can help developer to follow? Yes, I surely have a checklist and I also have a, a book written by a Japanese researcher only to understand how to secure modules along with code snippets. So I will be uh, sharing the details after the webinar. How to handle performance issue for encryption? See, uh, this is uh, this this involves a bit of functional testing part. So uh, the basic thing is, you need to. What I suggest is, if if you encrypt, okay, if you, if you encrypt, there is some or the other way that it will be decrypted, and there will be a lag in providing the information. There will be a lag and there will be a performance issue. So if you are preferring security, then you have to bear with the lag. Otherwise, you have to uh, you do not have to store anything on your DB. What you can do is first facilitate a login and then let everything come from the server. And once the session is expired, let everything be destroyed. So this uh, will reduce a bit of lag which rather involves huge encryption techniques and uh, performing uh, the, crypt, the crypt based techniques and everything. Yeah, any other queries? Will SSL certificate secure data in motion? Yes. SSL certificate will secure a data in motion, but we need to make sure whether the SSL certificate itself is secure. So what we have to do is we need to perform a full fledged analysis on the SSL certificate. Uh, what are the ciphers being used to connect? What are the protocols being used? Are the old protocols being used? What is the key length being used? So what I would recommend is if you're looking for something open source, test SSL labs is something which is uh, present uh, 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 which is uh, hosted by Qualys, where you can give your domain and it will uh, give you the strength of SSL certificate hosted. So basically in your mobile, even if you are having a mobile, there will be a uh, URL or domain which is uh, which, which is taking the request, right? So you can provide that domain to the test SSL labs and it will give you the strength of certificates along with a detailed analysis. Yes, uh, do you have uh, an Android testing methodology to share with us? Yes, as I told you, I'll also, uh, uh, along with the secure coding gui guidelines, I'll also share a Android testing methodology where uh, you can integrate the various processes into your HDLC so that you have a secure output. Yes, I do have a testing methodology for iOS, I'll also share that. So anything I share, I'll share it both for iOS and Android. So any other queries? Can obfuscated APV, APK uh, will be reverse engineered? Yes, an obfuscated APK can be reverse engineered, but once you reverse it, it is not an obfuscated APK. It is obfuscated code within an APK. So an APK can be reverse engineered. See, reverse engineering in the sense, 
you are just getting everything out of the application later whether you are understanding the application or not that is the rest part so if the code is obfuscated then uh, you will be able to reverse engineer but you will not be able to make anything out of the uh, application so yes uh, thanks for suggesting code obfuscation is another uh, best practice in order to uh, save a sensitive uh, code within your application uh, to be exposed Yeah, so I think that concludes it all. Thank you very much for attending and for any uh, further queries. Uh, I'll just uh, display the slide with my contact details. So that you can contact uh, me on this following email ID and my profile. Yeah. So thank you very much. So have a safe and secure mobile application development. Thank you.